A small inscription on a mosque in Istanbul reads, Aaron Berta cut these runes. This is one of over 30 stones found in the city inscribed by Scandinavians, which date back to the 11th century. Strangely, the writing isn't Greek or Latin. Instead, it's in younger Futhark, a writing system used and developed by Old Norse peoples more than 1,000 miles away from a distant culture, the Vikings. How did it end up here? And what significance did the Vikings have in Istanbul? It's a story of empires, Vikings, and political deals that saw the creation of one of the most elite military forces man has ever seen. From warring outlaws raiding monasteries to becoming the private security force of the most powerful man on the planet, this is the story of the Viking runes in Hagia Sophia. The Vikings, based out of Denmark, Norway, and Sweden, sailed the seas in well-organized, war-hungry groups, ambushing coastal towns and looting anything of value. For hundreds of years, Vikings battered English and Irish coastal towns, even bringing some directly under Viking control. However, the Vikings spread much further than the British Isles, and despite the image as barbaric, godless pirates, Vikings eventually made their way into the palace of the most powerful man on earth. It began with the people of Rus, Swedish Vikings who had traveled through Russia and modern-day Ukraine to form a state named Kievan Rus in the 9th century. From here, the Kievan Rus traded beeswax, furs, and slaves while seizing the trade routes between Scandinavia and Europe's biggest capital, Constantinople, now modern-day Istanbul. As they carried out trade expeditions, they became known as Varangian, the fusion of the two proto-Norse words for trust and vow of fidelity. As a plural, it means a troop who are loyal only to each other. Much like the Viking raids on England, when these Swedish Vikings set out to sea for trading purposes, they developed their own code of ethics, a system they lived and died by. Their fortunes would change when they connected with Byzantium, which was formed when the Roman Empire was fractured into two. In the 9th century, Varangians served as mercenaries for the Byzantine Empire, beginning with an attack on southern Italy. But the relationship wasn't simple. Twice, barely in the space of 80 years, Swedish chieftains tried and failed to conquer Constantinople. Even with a complicated relationship, the two starkly different cultures slowly began to integrate through mutually aligned trade and politics. By 944, the people of Kievan Rus had converted to Christianity, influenced by Byzantium. The Byzantines admired the military qualities of Rus fighters. Strong, ferocious, and irrationally brave. Any leader who could bring them under his command would ensure success on the battlefield. A turning point came after Basil II came to the Byzantine throne in 976. In an instant, the 20-year-old had become the most powerful leader on the planet. He presided over seven million people, with a kingdom stretching from modern-day Turkey to Greece, Italy, and parts of Spain. However, his enemies were much closer to home. He faced the threat of internal revolts, challenging his power. Unsure who to trust, Basil used a stroke of genius, enlisting foreign troops for his security team. He called on Vladimir the Great, the Grand Prince of Kiev, to send him some strong, loyal Rus warriors. Vladimir agreed, dispatching a 6,000-strong force to Constantinople. After they easily crushed a rebellion, the emperor was so impressed that he requested a group of the best to permanently serve under him. Soon, 800 soldiers arrived in Constantinople to become what would be known as the Varangian Guard, an elite security force for the emperor. For Basil II, depending on a foreign military force with the Varangian values of trust and loyalty was incredibly strategic. He knew that this was a group of men completely detached from the internal politics of Byzantine. 
they would not be as easily corrupted as soldiers from inside Constantinople were. A place where politics was characterized by backstabbing, bribery, and assassinations. For that reason, Basil II intentionally wanted to keep the Varangian Guard isolated from the local population. He went to great lengths, even building a church for them, which he dedicated to Saint Olaf. They were also encouraged to maintain their own language, Norunt, rather than learn Greek. On the part of the soldiers, their service was a calculated move too, a kind of investment. The men of the Varangian Guard were usually well connected, coming from nobility or high status, since they were specially trained, which was expensive at the time. Even the tax to enter Constantinople was large enough to stop anyone born into poverty. They knew that an elite division of the Imperial Army would be compensated handsomely, and they struck a deal to earn a share of any goods pillaged during wartime. Under Basil's power, the Varangian Guard got to work unleashing terror on the Empire's neighbors, with tales of the axe-bearing barbarians spread throughout Europe. These weapons became infamous, a bearded battle axe, a long-handled Dane axe, and a mammon throwing axe, making them instantly recognizable. They also carried spears and arrows. In terms of protective equipment, each was dressed in a helmet and armor and held a shield to swat away incoming attacks. These shields were decorated with ravens, the bird of the Norse god Odin. In some campaigns, they set monasteries on fire and ransacked anything of value, in true Viking style. But their principal task wasn't on the battlefield. Instead, it was to protect the emperor, inside the great palace of Constantinople, and act as bodyguards during events or meetings. They would walk out ahead of the emperor at ceremonies, whipping crowd members to clear the way. With the help of the Varangian guard, Basil II had the longest reign of any Roman emperor, consolidating power and expanding power into Armenia, Bulgaria, Mesopotamia, the Balkans, and Georgia. Without the Swedish Vikings, the Kievs, and the Varangian guards, the Byzantine Empire under Basil would not have been nearly as successful. This golden age for the Vikings wasn't going to last, but what would it take to finally bring down the Varangian guard? When Basil II died, successive Byzantine emperors usually followed his example by keeping the Varangian guard with them, winning battle after battle against an increasing number of enemies, including the Turks and the Normans. But after Constantinople was captured by Venetian and Frankish troops during the Fourth Crusade in 1204, the Varangian Guard ambitiously supported a coup to install a new emperor, Alexios V Dukas. This proved to be a desperate mistake. It only lasted two months before Crusaders breached the city once again, and Alexios V abandoned the city. The Varangian Guard eventually surrendered after the next emperor refused to increase their already big salaries. The city continued to be a prized possession of empires, a symbol of the Western world's prominence, and eventually, its collapse. It changed hands a number of times between the Latin Empire and the Byzantines, but all that came to an end when the Ottoman Empire invaded and took control of the city in 1493. By that time, any record and reference to the Varangians in the area trailed off, they had disappeared. However, the fortunes and heroes had already been forged. Most former Varangian guard members returned home to the north with huge material wealth and formidable reputations, which they converted into legitimate power. One, named Haralda Hirfurga Sigurdsson, served as a Varangian guard chief before going on to become the King of Norway. He is now considered one of the greatest in history, overseeing an era of stability while invading Denmark and England. He was a well-respected military leader, having earned his reputation in the Varangian Guard. The conquests of the Varangian Guard were so terrifying, they bordered on myth and epic leading to the survival of the Viking image in the literature of other civilizations. Centuries after the Varangian guards had disbanded, Greek folktales and stories circulated, 
depicting them as bodyguards to kings, noble warriors, and challenges for heroes to overcome. But there is a collection of inscriptions, left by the Vikings themselves, that have attracted great archaeological interest. In 1964, more than 800 years later, after the Varangian Trail went cold, researchers found three faded Swedish inscriptions carved into marble on the top floor of the Hagia Sophia. The former church is still standing today in a city now known as Istanbul. One is signed by Arimbother, another by a man, Haftan, and a third named Arni. These three men likely traveled to Constantinople to work as part of the Varangian Guard. But out of all the places in Constantinople, why did they choose to leave their mark in the Hagia Sophia? Its name translates to Holy Wisdom, and since it was originally built by Roman Emperor Constantius II as a church, it has functioned as a holy place for many different cultures and religions. After it was burned down twice, the Hagia Sophia was reconstructed in 537 under Justinian the Great. The architecture was an astonishing achievement. The central dome stood as the biggest in the world for more than 800 years. Over the next 10 centuries of Byzantine rule, the Hagia Sophia served as one of the most important structures of the empire, the central church of the Greek Orthodox religion. And like the rest of Constantinople, it underwent immense change. As Athenians, Persians, Spartans and Macedonians all wrestled for control of the city, they applied their own interpretation to it. This tapestry of cultures, languages and people has made for some fascinating relics that archaeologists are still finding. The markings of soldiers, likely part of the Varangian Guard, are a testament to that. Swedish immigrants serving in the Byzantine Empire, writing in a church that would centuries later be converted. After the fall of Constantinople to the Ottoman Empire, Hagia Sophia was turned into a mosque. But the markings of the once indispensable Varangian Guard are still inscribed. Now, the city is known as Istanbul, and the markings in the Hagia Sophia Grand Mosque are still there, reminding us of the unlikely history of Swedish Vikings in Constantinople.